Okay, fine. So uh, we're going to start. So uh, welcome. This is the demo lecture for CFA Level 2. Uh, my name is Jonathan Lau. And um, what we'll be going through today is Level 2 um, information. Okay, so let's, um, let's get started. So a little bit about myself. Um, I um, was in finance for the last uh, for 12 years of experience in asset management and wealth management and corporate finance. And then um, latterly moved to Hong Kong and I have been training uh, CFA, uh, CFA candidates for level one and level two for the last uh, six years. Okay, so um, happy to be here and happy to go through any more details on this um, as you like. Okay, so today's agenda is to run through level two uh, exam points. Okay, details to note. So you will have passed level one and uh, you're thinking about doing level two and uh, we'll run through uh, what you need to think about. Okay, and then I'll do a, a quick demo lecture, the latter part, um, so it's the last, last part. We'll just run through uh, some of the uh, alternative slides, which is one of the topics in level two. Okay, so a uh, big thing to note for, uh, for the exams for CFA is we have moved to computer-based exams. Okay, so um, so this is this is uh, this is big. This is very different. And um, what does that mean? So we have right now. If you're here and you're listening to the seminar, you will be interested in perhaps taking the exam here, level two, in February. Okay, so uh, right now it's September. The course will start uh, beginning of November. Okay, and we will get you up, geared up to do to do the exam in February. Okay, you don't have to do it in February. Okay, if you want to, of course, you can do it in August. That's absolutely fine. Okay, you've got two chances for next year to do to do the exam. Okay, now um, you can see here this is this is how the exams are going to go on for next for next few years. Okay, if you looked at the exam set schedule last year, they were a little bit different. Okay, but this is going to be how how the exams will play out. Okay, and this doesn't really apply to us now. If we're thinking about taking level two, we've passed level one, then uh, we can't take the adjacent exam window, but of course if you fail February, of course you can simply do August because there's a six month gap. Okay, that's what we're saying here in that little box uh, underneath. Okay, so this really is more applicable to, to level one, I would say, although of course, if you pass the February exam, and I hope you do, that means you cannot take the May exam. And you probably wouldn't really be able to take the May exam anyway because it's such a short period of time to prepare. Okay, but of course, going by this rule here, you need to leave a six month interval between each of these testing windows. Okay, so if you pass level two in the February exam, you cannot do it in May, but you will just do it level three in, in November. Okay, so that would be your route um, if you pass level two this coming February. Okay, so that's how, how these exams will work. Okay, so again, just to reiterate that, okay, so we are thinking about taking level two in February next year. If we pass happy days, then we will take level three. We can take level three uh, in November that same year. Okay, which means, and again, if you pass that, then you've got all three levels. And if you have your four years of investment-related uh, work experience, then you will be able to apply for your charter and, uh, and pay your fees and be able to put CFA behind your name. Okay, so that's, that's all good. Okay, now if, uh, unfortunately, you fail, then you will take the next level two exam, or you can take the next level two exam in August that same year. Okay, so, uh, and then of course, uh, we're, we're down to here. So again, if we pass it, then we'll move on to the next uh, gray. The next one is level three. And if it's August 2022, if we go back to here, that means we've passed this one, but here we can't go into November. It's too short anyway. So therefore, the next one would be May 2023. Okay, hopefully we pass and we can do the charter. Okay, so that's just the route. So do think a little bit about the, the route uh, that you might need to take to, in order to prepare um, for, for your, um, to make some plans. Okay. 
Now the topic area weights for the exam. Okay, so you've done level one. Okay, I don't know how long ago you may have done level one. Okay, level one, it used to be um, just little, uh, it used to tell you exactly how, what percentage of the exam it was. And actually level one has changed recently as well. And now that they are also ranges. Okay, but level two actually has been ranges for a little while. Okay, so you can see there, um, 10 to 15 percent for ethics, 5 to 10 percent for quants, etc., etc. Okay, now what does that mean? Um, it's, it means that there's going to be a slightly different way of preparing yourself for these level two exams. Okay, so before it may have said something like, I think it was maybe 6 percent in alternatives in previous exam uh, years. Okay, and you might have thought to yourself, oh, 6%. Okay, I may be able to do without 6%. Okay, but now if you were to, to be light and not spend as much time on alternatives, well, now it's 5 to 10%. Okay, so it could be 5%, meaning you don't, maybe don't need to study too much for it, but it could be 10%, okay, which is a, which is a much bigger uh, weighting, and therefore, really, you can't afford to leave any topics out. Okay, the short, the long and the short of it is, you can't really afford to leave any topics completely um, unrevised. Okay, you do need to cover everything. Okay, as before, um, it's really all about coverage. The 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 CFA exams. Okay, so um, now, why are they sort of nice um, nice numbers around here? Okay, we'll talk about that. They are they are going to be in vignette format. Okay, so this is another big difference between level one and level two. Okay, so level two, we have um, item sets. Okay, so vignette means item sets. Okay, meaning um, each uh, of the questions will be an item set between four questions and six questions each. Okay, I think they'll probably tend to more to do the four questions nowadays, but they could be six questions, I believe. Okay, so what that means is they'll give you uh, maybe a page and a half of information, perhaps. Okay, and then on those quest on that information, they will ask you your four to six questions. Okay, so that's vignette format. In other words, they give you a lot more information to digest, and the questions can be trickier. Okay, so for example, um, ethics. In level one, every question's got just got a little short, uh, short piece of uh, information, and you've got 90 seconds per question to do it. So it's a lot of um, quick fire-ish type questions. Okay, some slightly longer questions perhaps, but not too many, because it's supposed to be 90 seconds per question. But level two now, you've got 44 multiple choice questions in the first exam, 44 multiple choice questions in the second exam. Okay, so. Um, what that means is there are about three minutes per question, okay? So um, the time that you get is going to be two hours and 15 minutes per exam. You've got two exams, okay? Which brings you to about three minutes per question, okay? Three minutes per question, okay? Um, which means you have more time, okay? And you'll need some of that time, of course, to read the information. Okay, and then answer those questions, and they're, they're going to be trickier questions, okay? So they're going to give you more information, more ways to trip you up. Okay, so the level two exam is quite different to the level one exam, um, so you do need to be able to prepare for these types, uh, this different exam format. Okay, and then what else? Uh, the exam window. Okay, so again, in previous years, if you've done level one or level, uh, level two before, before these computer-based exams, you know, before computer-based, there were written paper and, uh, paper and, and pencil exams, okay? Um, and you just, everyone did the exam all on one day, okay? All of it on a, on a Saturday, okay? Now you have an exam window, okay? So now we've got uh, like five days here. This is the exam window for the February window. And you go online, you go and choose uh, when is convenient for you, go and take that day off, and, um, and then you can sit your exam then, okay? So that's a little bit different. You, can, you have a bit more flexibility now with these computer-based exams. Okay, now, what else? Um, okay, pass rates. Okay, so we know the CFA is a, is a hard exam to pass. Well, you've passed level one, so fantastic. Um, and level one's pass rates actually have come out to be very, very low this year. Okay, so if you've passed this year, very, very uh, congratulations to you. Now, level two, now level two has always been a little bit higher, it looks like. So level one, you can see the, res uh, the pass rates have been low 40s. 
and level two has tend to be sort of mid 40s, mid to high 40s perhaps. Uh, and actually last year all the numbers ab across the board were particularly high for I'm not sure what reason. Okay. Now this year it's dropped a bit again. Okay, so it's a little bit volatile in terms of the uh, the pass rates. Okay, it just it feels to me that the uh, this has been the the computer based exams, the computer based exam um, period uh, seems to be uh, slightly lower. Okay, slightly lower. Now still better than that uh, than 25 percent at least. That's that's good. Okay, and that's really all the good news that there is on the pass rates, okay? Because level two is obviously for people who have passed level one, okay? So your competition is now higher, okay? So um, it is a higher pass rate generally, but you are competing against people who have passed level one, okay? So it is stiffer competition. You do need to, uh, to beat out um, maybe 60%, uh, maybe more, depending on, on, on the pass rate, of course, next year. Okay, so the, it is going to be um, a challenge, okay, more of a challenge than the level one exam, more than the level one exam, what level one exam was. Okay, and then the other point I'd like to make is, actually, a lot of these people who, who do the level two exam have also done the level two exam before, okay, because, of course, not everyone passes level two exams straight away, Okay, so there'll be plenty of people who will redo the level two exam. Okay, so you're competing against people who, of course, have passed level one, but you're also competing against people who have failed level two once and therefore have sat it again. Okay, so this is um, this is challenging. Okay, so it is hard uh, a hard exam that you do need to prepare for, and the material is harder as well. Okay, so um, you know there are there have been cases I know people. Doing level one, you know, it is somewhat uh, a lot of the foundational material that you may have covered before in a, in a degree. A lot of the topics may be covered before. Level two, some of the topics you may have covered before as well if you have done a finance degree. But actually, there's a lot of topics in level two that uh, that you will not have studied for for sure. Okay, so they they don't appear in, um, in 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 sort of finance degrees generally. Okay, some of them are very specific topics. Okay, so there are there are there's definitely harder material in level two. Okay. So again, just to reiterate, um, level one versus level two. Okay, level one, uh, the the initial problem really is volume, okay? There's a lot of information to take in, particularly if you don't have a financial background. Okay, now level two, actually I've got to say volume is still an issue, okay? It's not, uh, it doesn't disappear. There's still plenty of material in level two as well, but um, it's, it builds on your level one knowledge, okay? It really does build on your ne level one knowledge which means uh, you don't want to throw away your level one books, okay? So if you've got the Schweizer books from level one, if you've got your slide packs and your notes, don't throw them away, okay? You will need to build upon that information, okay? So the questions are not going to be the same, but you may refer, you may have um, texts and uh, topics that refer back to your previous uh, understanding of level one, and you may want to uh, remember and uh, and guide yourself and see uh, and refresh yourself as to what those topics uh, were all about. Okay, but we do build on level one, going to level two. Okay, which is why I always say if you pass level one uh, and you want to take a break before doing level two, what well you can do, but I think it's best to keep those two levels together as in as far as you can. Okay, between level two and level three, I think um, there's a bit of more of a case to taking a break if you want to. Okay, but level one, level two, they do really build upon each other. There is a lot of overlap. Okay. All right, so we were saying this before. Okay, so level two, higher level of competition. So you are competing against people who have already passed level one. Um, a lot of the people who have done level two have already done it before. Okay, so there's, there's, there's a lot of people who have had much more. If this is the first time you're doing level two, uh, they will have more experience with most of the topics. And the pass rate is still fairly challenging, still not high, okay? So we do need to spend a good amount of time to study for level two. In fact, I would suggest more time to study level two than to study level one for sure, okay? So if you took, let's say, uh, four months to study level one, to prepare, to, to, to run through and pass the exam, which is not, which is good, level four, four months of, of good study I think is, is fair. I think you need um, 
bit more for level two. Okay, so um, you do need to um, um, start early as much as you can and keep up with the course and keep up with the materials and your timeline and your plan. Okay. Now, what are we uh, showing you here is our overall um, live sessions and our course. Okay, so what we have here is our education phase at first. So that will be nine weeks of uh, running through the key concepts. Okay, so that's six hours uh, on a Sunday for this course. Okay, where we're running through the key materials. Um, and we're doing, we're, we're spending less time on, on getting you to do questions. Okay, maybe some time, but not too much time. Okay, so the general split, the general guideline we give is 80% running through the materials and about 20% of the time uh, running through some questions and drills and stuff. Okay, now after that, um, we will have the revision phase. Okay, the revision phase is a four and a half week uh, course that we will be going through much more questions. Okay, so now we flip it around, it's going to be sort of 80% of the time uh, running through the questions, giving you some time to do the questions, and then debriefing the questions, and then a bit of a little bit of time uh, running through reviewing topics um, and refreshing topics. Okay, so it's going to be much more question drilling. Okay, and then after that, we have a mock exam, which will be online, which you can do. Okay, so that will be the two two hours and 15 minutes exam um, that you will do, multiple choice, vignette style, just like the real thing. And then we will have a, an evening session, a three-hour evening session to run through that and any other questions you may have. Okay, so that is the full course that we are, we are providing. Okay, so... Um, what we're we saying here, we're saying that um, if you go through the curriculum, then um, then it's tricky. It's hard to pass the exam. Okay, so if you've gone through level one and you've gone through our courses, then you'll know what I'm talking about. Okay, if you have gone through level one by yourself and and studied on studied by yourself, then fine, no problem. That's good. But if you've studied level one and just used the curriculum books by, it, by, by yourself, I would say that is very challenging and very tough. And if you've passed doing that, fantastic. Um, I think at least think about getting the Schweizer books. Okay, the Schweizer books are some books that uh, Kaplan produce. Okay, and um, these are sort of exam oriented books that have most of the material, most information in the, from the curriculum. Okay, and they are condensed versions as well. Okay, so at least use the Schreiser books, I would say. Okay, now if you come to our live classes, then uh, what you'll have is our four books of uh, slide packs. Four books of slide packs. Okay, and the slides, which we'll see some in a minute uh, when we run through alternatives a little bit. Um, and you'll see the, see the idea what what we're going through here. Okay. Now what we're saying here is, if you're looking at uh, a few of these learning outcome statements, six of them, 51A to 51F, learning outcome statements. Of course, these are the things that you need to learn, understand, and be able to uh, answer questions on. Okay. If if we just take that as an example, uh, they may cover about 30 pages of text in the curriculum. Uh, which is a lot of, uh, it doesn't sound a lot, but uh, the curriculum is sort of really tiny writing and um, it's, um, it's, it's, it's really textbook material. Okay, so it's going to be hard even just to read through those 30 pages, never mind digest and understand it. Okay, we're saying in our slide packs, we will um, sort of condense that material to roughly 16 slides. Uh, making it a lot easier to digest and understand. Okay, of course, not all of that information is going to be in those 16 slides, but you know the core materials, what's going to be tested, uh, is 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 pretty much there. Okay, so that's how we can help you with our materials. Okay, then after the education phase, we've got the revision phase. Okay, so this is going to give you another big book of questions. You'll have a big book of questions, and then book two will be mind maps. So you'll have uh, a big book of uh, formulas and bullet points for your reference. Okay, so this is really for your reference. We won't really run through that per se, but we will run through uh, books. Actually, I think there's two books, so book 1A and maybe one book B. Okay, we've got two books of questions for our level two revision course, and, uh, and we'll get you to do questions and review those questions. We won't even do all of those questions. There's a lot of questions there, so you can do the other questions that we don't cover in the class uh, on your own. Okay, so great to have more practice material. Okay, doing questions is one of the most important ways that you can um, uh, really 
digest the material better, see where your weaknesses are, and be able to pass this exam. Okay, and we said afterwards, you can do the, uh, the, the mock exam afterwards if you want to. Okay, so that is the uh, run-through on the uh, level two materials. So if there are any questions, then please do feel free to, to ask. Okay, but if not, that's fine. Okay, so then we're going to go through a demo lecture on alternatives, just to wrap up. So, okay, and then this uh, this slide here again is just referring to how our slide packs work. Okay, so this is uh, an example slide actually from a level one slide pack. That's absolutely fine. Uh, you've got the heading here, and then you've got the learning outcome statement here, 52A. Okay, so as we run through the materials during the course, if you do have any issues later on or during the class, uh, just know that you can always refer back to this learning outcome statement, and you can go back to go back and refer to the Schweizer books, which you will have as part of your course materials. Um, or if you need to, you can always go back to the curriculum as well. Okay, which are those books that you will receive just for registering for the exam. Okay, so if you register for the exam, you will get this curriculum books uh, in soft copy. You'll get uh, a PDF. If you pay a little bit more, you'll get the hard copy. Okay, then you'll get, um, you'll get the books uh, to take away if you want to. Okay, but I guess, as I mentioned, I'd really rather use the Schweizer books most of the time. Okay, the only time that I'd really recommend using the curriculum is for covering ethics, okay, because then the source material is particularly important. Okay, that will be the key. Okay, so really only ethics, in my opinion. Okay, so let's run through alternatives. Okay, and I picked private equity valuation to run through. Okay, so we're going to go through a few slides on private equity. Okay, so um, private equity. What is it? So, alternatives in level one was a relatively small topic. Okay, now in level two is a much larger topic. It's still a relatively small topic. Still, I think five to ten percent, I believe. Okay, so um, still not massive, but again, like I mentioned, you cannot leave any topics behind. Okay, they could be up to ten percent of the exam, which is a lot to leave on the table if you don't cover it at all. Uh, so, private equity. Now, what is it? Private equity is. Um, one one approach of um, of investing, let's say. Okay, so what is private equity rather than public equity? Okay, so private versus public. Well, public means it's listed. Okay, so listed on an exchange. So like the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, for example. Okay, so if it is public, it's listed. But if it's private, then it's not listed. Okay. So investments in equity that is not listed. Okay, so this could be an investment in private equity. So it's already private, and you just buy some, or it might have been public, and you buy it out and you take it private. Okay, so it could uh, could be private and it's still private, or it could be public and you've taken it private. Okay, now how do you then generate value? How do you create the value from taking it private. Okay, now there are a few ways. Okay, now a major way uh, is to uh, re engineer the firm. Okay, so now that you've taken it private, you can start to uh, fire people. You know, you can do some more cost cutting, which you may be able to have done before when it was public, before you could have done the same thing, but actually, often public companies are more short term focused. Okay, because they are looking at quarterly earnings. They've got investors. Investors are always uh, looking at uh, what you're doing, and you need to release information to them because of the listing requirements. Okay, so there's more information that you need to give as a public company that you may not have to give as a private company. Okay, so that might allow you to think more long term. Okay, and and be able to fire more people, perhaps. Okay, that might be something that you could do. You may also have some more expertise okay so you as a private equity fund may specialize in healthcare for example okay which means maybe you've got lots of uh, CEOs from the past of big healthcare companies 
and they've got big networks, and you can maybe use some of their expertise to help this other healthcare company that you have taken private. Okay, so you may have special expertise, um, and that may, may also help to generate some returns. Okay, um, lower cost debt financing, perhaps. We'll talk about debt financing later. And then what else? Uh, goal alignment is particularly important in private equity. Okay, we can match the goals of the, uh, the management of the company that we've just acquired and the owners, which is us. Okay, so we as a private equity company have acquired this company. We can start to help management uh, think more long term and give them some rewards. Okay, so uh, this is how we can, we can sort of generate some value. We'll talk about this in a minute. So alignment of economic interests. Focus on long term rather than short term, okay, because they are private. And how else do we align, how do we align the interests? of the managers, there's a number of ways. Okay, so for example, we've taken them private, and then maybe sort of five years later, we want to build up this company, make it grow, make it more profitable, and then list it, go and IPO it again, okay? Now, if we list it, then we can say, uh, we can give the managers some of that upside, okay? So if the managers, the uh, the company managers have done a good job, then uh, we can give them some big bonuses. Okay, so that's an example of how we can align the interests of the, the owners, us, perhaps, the private equity firm, acquiring this company, and the managers. Okay, so that's, that's particularly important. Okay, now the managers might, be, might work harder for that, for that uh, big payday. Okay, so that's an example. Okay. Now, when we talk about private equity, there are actually uh, two major kinds of, uh, of approach we can take. Okay, we can look at the venture capital approach, and the other approach is the um, LBO approach, leverage buyout, okay, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Okay, so they are two very different ways of approaching private equity valuation. Okay, so. Let's look at venture capital first, and then in a minute we'll talk about leverage buyouts. Okay, so venture capital. What is venture capital? Venture capital is where we are investing in someone's crazy idea. Okay, we are startup investing. Okay, so this is startup investing. Okay, so we are looking at trying to find the next Facebook the next Uber, the next company, the big company that's going to launch and list for a lot of money on an exchange. Okay, so we're going to look at buying Facebook, but not when Facebook's already massive, but when Facebook has, uh, when Mark Zuckerberg, you know, one year out from, from, from dropping out of university, you know, he's, a, he's, he's on his own, he's got a small team, perhaps, and we are looking at, at, at buying some of that small business. Okay, so... Asset base is weak. There's basically nothing in this company yet. It's very, very nascent. Okay, um, cash flows are unpredictable. We don't know whether this is going to work. You know, a lot of these investments are in newish type companies um, in, in a new industry, perhaps. Okay, so um, it's really hard to determine and re uh, how much cash flow they're going to uh, generate in the future. We're hoping a lot, but it could be not so much. Okay, so it's very tr tricky to assess risk. Okay, very tricky. Okay, we will want to, one way might be to try and get some cash flows to do a forecast model, but this is a very hard thing to do uh, for a startup company. Okay, so we may try to do that. If we try to do that, we are going to be using uh, interest rates um, of, of 20, 30, 40, 50%, you know, in order to cover our risks. Okay, and it's, it's a very hard thing to do, but we will have an attempt at it uh, in level two. Okay, not here, but later on in, 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 the, in, the, uh, in the course. Okay, so the exit strategy. How do we uh, make our money? Well, we're going to try and sell it at some point, okay, but it may not be for a, num a number of years, uh, and it's, it's going to be very tough. Okay, venture capital investments, um, we know we, we're going to have a lot of misses. Okay, this is... Uh, startup investing, okay? 
So how we, what sort of investment are we going to get? We are going to put in equity investment. Okay? We can't really borrow much money because this is such a new company. Okay? So they don't really have any assets of which to borrow from. Okay, so banks will not really be wanting to lend money to these types of companies uh, in the, on the most part. And we ourselves want to take a large equity stake, and that's how uh, we are going to play this. Okay, so as I mentioned then, the returns are going to be astronomical from the successful investments. Okay, if we invested in Facebook, uh, we'd be very, very happy. Okay, but... How, what's the chances of investing in a Facebook? Okay, not very high. Okay, so we are really expecting uh, many failures. You know, nine out of ten of our investments are pretty much going to go to zero, or pretty much uh, are not going to succeed. Okay, so we really want those successful ones to do very well indeed, to sort of uh, balance off the ones that didn't do so well. Okay, so our fund is going to be very skewed to the successes. How are we going to take our our our, uh, our fees basically through carried interest? Okay, through performance. Okay, that's really where we're going to take it from. Okay, so how does venture capital investing uh, differ to buyouts? So I called them LBOs before, leverage buyouts, but that is uh, buyout investing. Okay, so what a, what is buyout investing? Well, it's really the complete opposite. Okay, so. Uh, now, what we're doing is we are targeting uh, relatively mature businesses with stable and predictable cash flows. Okay, now why would we do that? Because our whole uh, thesis is completely different. Okay, now what we're doing is we are going to buy this company and borrow as much money as we can. Okay, that is how this is. This is very different to venture capital investing. Okay, so buyout investing, we are targeting a company. Okay, they may have a little bit of debt on their balance sheet already, uh, or they may not. It's up to them. But either way, we can borrow more money based off their substantial asset base. Okay, and why can we do that? Because they are throwing out cash. Okay, they, they are earning. They are earning cash flows every month, and we can use those cash flows to pay back a loan. Okay, so that is how we can we can buy out this company. Now, uh, again, so you can think of this in terms of um, who is the bank likely to lend money to? Okay, they are much more likely to lend uh, to someone. Let's say, think about an individual who has a stable and predictable salary every year. Okay, so if you are a high-flying lawyer then the bank is very happy to, to, to give, make you a loan in order to buy a house. Okay? But if you are an entrepreneur, and if we're looking at venture capital investing, you are basically an entrepreneur, you have no assets to speak of, and the cash flows are not even there yet, you know, you're just burning money right now because you have no product perhaps, or not much of a product, no real customer base, therefore you cannot borrow so much money. Okay? So it's very different to venture capital, where you're looking at startup investing, LBO investing or buyout investing is you're targeting much more, much larger, much more mature companies that are already producing and uh, uh, pay, paying nice cash flows to you, but they might not be growing very much. Okay, so we can think of some targets for buyout companies would be things like pubs, okay, pub companies, um, utility companies. Um, anything that is, uh, is, is, is you know, it's, it's uh, relatively stable and just making some some nice cash flows every year. Okay, so these are the kind of buyout investments that we are talking about. Now, exit strategy then is much more predictable. Okay, now the question is, how much debt do we want to to, to uh, take on? Okay, and the real answer is as much as the bank will lend us, as much as we can take, is what we will probably try and take. Okay. Um, so uh, obviously, the more debt we take, the the riskier it is because you know if we don't uh, meet those interest payments, then of course we default and uh, and that's not good. Okay, so subject to that, we will try and take on as much debt as we can. Okay, then what do we do? Then we wait for a few years. Hopefully, we may be able to uh, reduce some inefficiencies in the company as before. Okay, we'll always try and do that. Okay, but we go and pay down as much debt as we can over the next few years. 
Okay, so as we use the cash flows of the company to pay down that debt, then five years later, six or seven years later, we sell the company. Okay, we sell it, maybe we IPO it, maybe we sell it to another company, okay, and that's how we make our money. Now, therefore, the exit strategy is much more predictable. Okay, we have a much better idea that uh, these investments will be, will make sense, okay? Because the cash flows are stable, so that's all that's all done, and uh, we borrowed the money. We know how much. We know we can afford those interest payments, okay? Maybe a little bit of risk in terms of the IPO market if we are trying to IPO it, but we always have the choice of perhaps selling it on as a trade sale, okay? In other words, get another pub company to take over this company, and uh, you know they can make some synergies out of it, okay? So most of these buyer investments. Uh, will work. Okay? They will uh, make sense from an investing point of view. Okay, so relatively low variability in success, rare failures. They they will invest and they will tend to uh, to work most of the time. Okay, and then what type of return are they really aiming for? Okay, the internal rate of return that makes sense for them and what they are targeting it tends to be. Uh, 20 to 25 percent. Okay, so more like 25 percent uh, uh, before. Maybe it's coming down a little bit uh, in recent years, um, as everyone chases those same companies and, and interest rates are so low. Okay, so um, but it, you know once uh, once you can um, take over this company and you know the price you're paying and you know how much debt you're bringing up and how much interest you need to pay on that debt. Um, the maths work, then you, you can be fairly certain that uh, you should be able to make some money at least. And how are you going to make your fees? Again, you're going to have some performance fees and uh, you basically own the entire company, so you will also have some, uh, some other uh, monitoring fees as well. Okay, now in terms of valuing private equity companies, okay, now we've just gone through two very different uh, approaches. Okay, so the buyouts are much easier to value, okay, basically. Okay, we could use a discounted cash flow model because they are lots of cash flows, quite easily forecastable, they're quite stable, they're probably growing at inflation plus or maybe the population, uh, something like that, population growth. Uh, so we can use a discounted cash flow model, forecast the cash flows, discount them back to the present, add it up, that's going to be the value of this company. But if we're looking at a venture capital type investment, much harder to use DCF because we are really not sure uh, when those cash flows are going to arrive and uh, and how much how big they will be. Okay, so it's much harder to value a, uh, a startup using a DCF methodology. What about relative value? Now we could use comps analysis, comparative uh, ratios. Okay, so we could use PEs or uh, EBITDA ratios, okay, to go and compare and see uh, if our company is uh, trading uh, expensive or not, okay, and this could be used in conjunction with the DCF valuation, no problem, okay, but again, if we're looking at venture capital, much harder to use comps, because there may not be any comps, okay, so for a venture capital company, uh, it might be a completely new industry, so new technology, there may not exist any comps that will be appropriate. Okay, so it's much harder to find comparables that you might be able to use. Okay, in terms of debt, as we said, buyouts, we're going to use as much debt as we can. Okay, really take on lots of debt, uh, and we can do that because we've got nice stable cash flows that will pay the, uh, the interest off. Whereas if we're looking at venture capital, it's a startup. There's no real assets to speak of. We really won't be able to take on much debt. The banks are not willing to lend to us. And we, as, uh, as owners, uh, part owners of this business, uh, will we take, we'll want to take a large equity share as much as we can get. Okay, so what drives the returns for buyout and venture capital? Okay, well, the key driver for buyouts for me is really this one here, debt reduction. Okay, so for me, you're going to uh, pay down as much debt every year using the cash flows of the company. Okay, get that debt down, and then now as the debt comes down, your equity value basically uh, increases, and then when you sell it, it's worth that much more, your equity that you put in. 
which is going to be as little as possible at the beginning, is going to be uh, is going to be uh, more in five six years time. Okay, and that's really where you're going to make most of your money. Um, you know, if you can uh, grow the earnings by cost cutting, fantastic. Okay, and if you can. Um, And if you can um, ex buy at a low valuation and sell at a high valuation, of course that's great. But you may not be able to do that, okay? Because that's just the market, okay? So it's really uh, that might be a bit of luck involved. Now, in terms of uh, venture capital, um, key drivers are really building a business that sustains and uh, and that's that's uh, and you may want to look at future dilution, okay? So you are entering. And buying this company at the beginning, and maybe as you uh, as the, as the company progresses, becomes larger, they take on more rounds of investing, and so you might be diluted to some extent. Um, and then there's something called pre-money valuation uh, methodology, which we will run through in the course. Okay, so um, so that these these uh, approaches for private equity are are very different. Okay. Then uh, let's talk a little bit about exit routes, okay? And then I think I'll wrap up, okay? So, um, how do we then make our money from uh, from these PE investments, okay? Now, the 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 one that's going to generate the highest value is an IPO, okay? So, be it um, a leveraged buyout, be it a venture capital investment, either way, um, if they are a large company and they, and lots of people want to buy them. Um, listing on a big exchange is going to be give, probably give you the biggest uh, value. Okay, so this is uh, is the the number one in terms of uh, we've made it, we've made a lot of money, fantastic. Okay, and then once you've listed, you've got high liquidity to your shares, of course, because now they're trading on exchange. Um, you will be able to attract better management. Okay, because. Uh, Managers with experience want to join other companies that are listed large that can pay you good packages, can pay you options, can pay you in shares. Okay, so this is going to help um, with the um, the sort of level of a management that you can attract. Okay, and you'll be able to access more capital because people know who you are now that you're listed. Okay, now you are going to um, your name is out there. Okay, now people will know who you are. Okay, now the cons of doing an IPO is more costly. Okay, so it takes um, more time to, in order to do the due diligence. You need to do a roadshow. You need to pay the bankers. You need to pay the lawyers. Okay, so um, more cost. Okay, fine, but not not really a big deal. Okay, if you can do an IPO and people are interested, then of course most companies will choose to do an IPO. But of course, timing is an issue. Okay, so in certain years the market is not good. There are just no deals, no IPOs uh, going, and uh, and you may may need to delay your IPO, which 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 happens um, which happens and is out of your control. Okay, now other ways of uh, making your money: secondary market sale. Okay, so you are going to sell your company to a trade buyer okay so we talked about maybe a pub company is your uh, lbo company uh, of choice your target and uh, five years later you've paid down the debt and now you're going to sell it to another pub company and this will also give you a pretty good valuation because there may be some synergies to be had okay this other pub company can combine with your pub company and you know they can let one of the ceos go they can let one of the hr departments go they don't need um two admin two accountants departments for example okay they can have a lot of cost synergies and maybe some revenue synergies as well okay so this might not be bad other exit routes um another management buyout okay so this is not so good okay so here you've tried to make your money uh, but if you had the choice of either one an IPO or two a trade sale, you'd probably do that. But if you can't, then maybe you want to sell to another firm or sell to the existing management. Okay, so do a management buyout, and they will then try with their own leverage. Okay, so you sell to the management; they will borrow using your your company's assets and try themselves in five or six years' time to reorganize, increase their Cash flows, perhaps, pay down their debt and sell. Okay, so this is a bit like another company trying to do a, an LBO instead, and you uh, therefore probably won't be at a good, good price because, of course, they want to make the money as well. 
Okay, and then the last one is is the worst liquidation. Okay, so you really haven't uh, succeeded, and you're just going to close the company down. Then fine, um, liquidate and uh, and take the take the hit. Okay, so of course that is that is not so good. Okay, so I think I will leave that here.